All right, so uh, I think we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, welcome all of you to this class and back for Wednesday nights. It's, it's good to see everybody. Um, I hope I remember how to do this in front of everybody. <laughs> I don't know. It's been a long time, almost six months, I think. But um, glad you're here and I uh, hope the Lord will use it to encourage you. Uh, during these strange times. Um, and welcome to those of you who are joining us uh, through the live stream. Glad you're joining us as well and pray that the Lord will use it in your lives. Um, let me pray to open and then we'll get started. All right. Well, Father, we thank you that you are in control, that nothing surprises you, uh, nothing forces your hand. You're not in reaction mode, but you are carrying out your purposes perfectly. Lord, help us to trust you <clears throat> in the midst of that. In the midst of these challenging times, that we would believe what you have said about yourself. And Lord, we pray for tonight that uh, you would use this time together to grow us in our faith, to remind us of your truth, especially related to spiritual warfare and what your scripture says about it. So we give you this time, pray that you be glorified in Christ's name. Amen. <clears throat> well, today, um, basically, I just want to give an introduction to this topic. It's a vast topic, and we're going to cover a lot of different facets in this class in the coming weeks. But Today, I just want to introduce the topic and get us thinking about it, raising some questions. We're not going to necessarily answer all these questions tonight, but just raise some questions as we approach the topic. And you may be asking, well, why of all the topics, why this class? And um, I mean, first of all, I think it's readily practical. Um, there is a spiritual war that the scriptures talk much about, and it's a very practical rubber meets the road kind of topic. Um, it's not just a theoretical thing. But just to kind of give you a window into my thinking about doing this topic in a class like this, um, a number of things contributed to it sort of sitting on the back burner of my mind uh, over the past few years. One is taking trips to Haiti. Um, I don't know if, who in this room has been down there, but um, those of you on the missions team hear the stories, but um, there's a lot of spiritual warfare going on that's more, that looks different than what we might see in our context. Um, and I remember the last time we went down there, we took the youth with us, and one of the evenings, Donnie St. Germain shared stories uh, with the youth and the rest of us just of, of the spiritual battle that, that is going on down there and with the influence of voodoo, influence of witch doctors, things like this. And you could see the eyes of the, <laughs> the teenagers just like this, you know. Um, and it was, it was interesting to watch, like, after that time together, uh, people asking the question, really wrestling with it, you know, is he for real? Is this stuff for real? Um, how, sh how do I make sense of this? Um, and definite curiosity uh, to, to find out more. So that, that kind of stirred my mind about, you know, well, what, you know, what does the Bible tell us about these things? And then another one, this is I've never had, really had, had this happen before, but shortly after I came on staff, maybe a year or two in, I got a phone call from a random lady here in the, in the community, and 99% of the time when you get calls from people you don't know in the community, they're usually looking for some sort of assistance, you know, financial assistance or whatever. And I was surprised that that wasn't what she was asking. Um, she wanted to speak to a pastor about her son, who she was concerned about. He had a number of uh, health issues, but also uh, spiritually, she said, I think he has a demon. I think he's possessed by a demon. Would you meet with him? 
And I'm thinking, I'm still trying to get to know people around here. <laughs> you know, and then, are you serious? Um, <clears throat> so what was my response? I said, sure, I'll, I'll meet with him. Uh, but then she said, well, what would you share with him? What would you do with him? That was a good question. And I don't know what her background was. I don't know if she was thinking, you know, I had some sort of, you know, ritual, ritual thing I would do with him to exercise this demon or, or, or whatever. Um, but, you know, I basically said, you know, I would share from the scripture and I'd pray. And, you know, if he's willing to listen, you know, I'll, I'll speak with him. But uh, unfortunately, that, that meeting never took place. I never heard from this lady again. Um, so I don't know what happened. But um, so that got me thinking, you know, it's like, so, you know, what is what does the Bible say about these things? Um, and then, you know, just I think for all of us, I mean, those are kind of on the fringe, you know, those are kind of more uh, bizarre scenarios. But, you know, for us in our culture and all the turmoil, you know, politically, socially, what's going on spiritually under the surface? Is there more to it than what we're seeing? So for all those reasons, I think this is an important topic to discuss. And David Paulison, in his book, Power Encounters, he's a Christian counselor. He just passed away. He had cancer. Um, but he's written a number of books on spiritual warfare. And he argues in that book that we need to reclaim spiritual warfare in the church. What he means by that is, speak biblically into it, you know, make biblical sense of these things as, a, as opposed to, you know, and he, he's in reform circles and sometimes our tendency is to, that's the charismatic stuff. We don't get into that. So we don't, we don't speak into it and we just kind of overlook it, ignore it, whatever. And people will fill in the gaps with unbiblical notions. So it's important to, to ask, what does the Bible say about it? Um, what can we say? So, and another danger I think we have is that we dismiss it all as made-up nonsense. Okay, fabricated stories, that kind of thing. Now, C.S. Lewis in his book, Screwtape Letters, um, some of you are familiar with that book. It's a creative uh, look at the influence of the enemy in the lives of believers. It's very creative. It's, it's very good. Uh, I think there's a lot of uh, biblical truth being illustrated there, though it's not, you know, self-consciously uh, citing verses and that kind of thing. But in that book, in the preface to it, he says, there are two opposite errors into which our race can fall about the devils, as he calls it. Uh, one is to disbelieve in their existence, and the other is to believe and to feel an excessive, unhealthy interest in them. They themselves, the devils, are equally pleased by both errors and hail a materialist or a magician with the same delight. So he's, he's highlighting these two opposite errors that we can make in approaching this topic. One is to make too much of it beyond its biblical proportions and be obsessed with these things. It, that can lead to sort of a, almost a pagan mysticism, spirituality. Or we make too little of it and we become rationalistic and materialistic like the unbelieving world largely is, um, at least in our country. Um, and Lewis says both are problematic. Those are two, they're both errors. So the question for us is which side do we tend to err on? Anybody want to offer a thought on that? I think, personally, we probably, in our context, we probably err on the side of ignoring it. At least we would say we believe, okay, the Bible talks about these things, but in everyday life, rubber meets the road, that's, it's not really there. It's kind of a practical uh, agnosticism about this issue. Um, so we, I think we make too little of it, perhaps. Um, so as we consider these things, uh, we need not only to look at what the Bible actually says about them, but I want to spend some time looking at 
some of the baggage that we bring into the discussion, into the topic as we approach it. Um, point one on your outline, <coughs> excuse me, where do we get our information from? And you might say information or baggage. Um, first of all, family. You know, what, what did your family think about these things? Uh, maybe you didn't even grow up in a Christian home uh, and that wasn't even talked about. That's something you sort of come into it, the discussion with. Uh, how, how were these things talked about? How were they modeled? How, how did, were they real? Were they just talked about? Were they actually realities that they dealt with as they passed these things down? Uh, what's our cultural influence? This is interesting. How are good and evil portrayed in the culture? How are they portrayed in literature, movies, or what we might call folk wisdom? This would be like, you know, grandma always said this about this thing, or, you know, this is what my ancestors talked, this was their little proverb about these matters. You know, ways, informal ways of seeing the world explaining the world, things like that. And of course your denominational, if you did grow up in a Christian home or a, a church going family, your denominational influence. How did they treat these matters? What was their emphasis and influence? I thought it'd be interesting and maybe entertaining, I don't know, but just to consider for a moment, you know, the issue of Satan and demons in particular in our culture. Why do we associate certain characteristics or visual representations uh, of these things as we do? For instance, the horns, the tail, the pitchfork, certain colors, red or black, associated with demons and Satan himself. You know, many have suggested that these kind of notions find their roots maybe maybe in a biblical image in a passage here or there but largely combined with pagan ideas and mythology for instance um, the horns the pointy beard <laughs> the horns um, in Greek mythology the satyrs uh, half man half horse uh, figures these kind of visual representations. Uh, the Greek god of the underworld, Pluto, had a trident, um, like a pitchfork. Things like this. Um, even in the Middle Ages, uh, depictions, visual depictions of demons and things like that had uh, bat wings, as opposed to you know, what we might assume, you know, nice white feathery angel wings sort of a antithesis of that. So, you know, there's a lot of this kind of stuff that goes on, you know, how we combine, how, where do we get this vision of the enemy? Um, and how does that affect how we think about it? Um, in, again, in screw tape letters, and if you're familiar with the story, it's an older uncle demon <laughs> writing letters to his nephew, who is a apprentice demon and the older demon is giving advice on how to trip up man how to make him stumble how to uh, deceive man and he says this in one in one place the fact that devil he's the older one speaking to the younger the fact that devils are predominantly comic figures in modern imagination will help you if any faint su suspicion of your existence begins to arise in his mind, suggest to him a picture of something in red tights and persuade him to s that since he cannot believe in that, and this is an old textbook method of confusing them, he therefore cannot believe in you. And you see some of this in, you know, this book was written a number of decades ago, but um, the portrayal of these things is kind of like fantasy sometimes comic, sometimes horror film type stuff, uh, but not anything 
that's real or something to be taken seriously. Um, how about this? Even the vision or the visual of, and this isn't, I haven't seen this as, as often as maybe you used to, but in, in old movies and in cartoons, you would see the angel appear on one shoulder and the, the bad angel on the other shoulder. Um, you know, that that's interesting. That can actually be traced to some extra biblical works um, a number of centuries ago. That idea that each person is not only assigned a guardian angel per se, but also there's an evil angel that's associated with the person and you have to navigate between the two. So there's, there's an interesting depiction uh, that's you know, caught on in some, some ways through the centuries. And here's the thing with this baggage, with this information we bring into it. You'll come across some passages in the scriptures that are interpreted in elaborate ways that are not necessarily supported by the context of those passages. And you wonder, how can you do that? Well, a lot of the gaps are filled in with this baggage. And that's aiding or directing the exegesis or interpretation of the passage in a certain direction, uh, creating more elaborate schemes than the scriptures give information for. So all of this brings us to the second point on your outline, uh, worldview considerations. This comes into play. How you view the world. What influences your view of the world? That will come into play in how you conceive of spiritual battle, who the enemy is, and all of that. Um, you know, have you ever, I'm sure most of us had this experience where you read through the gospel accounts, you read through Jesus' ministry, and you know, he's encountering demons, he's casting out demons, he's being tempted by Satan. Um, these are unique things in redemptive history, but we can be tempted to think, you know, that's a, that's a long ways away from where I live <laughs> in the 21st century. I don't see that happening. How do we make sense of that difference in appearance with regard to the spiritual battle? Um, this is uh, David Powelson in that, the book I referenced earlier. He, he observes that much of Western intellectual life in the past 250 years, he was writing this maybe in the 90s, um, the last 250 years, intellectual life has been spent demythologizing God and Satan, good and evil. He says the practical atheism of modern intellectual life has made reality to be fundamentally material, social, but not spiritual. Belief in the devil or demons some kind of spiritual enemy out there is seen as primitive curiosity. Uh, the thing ignorant people resort to uh, when they don't understand chemical, neurological, psychological, and sociological factors. So that, that's, I'm not saying that's what you guys think here in this room, but that's a predominant view in our culture, and we live in this culture. And we may be influenced by it negatively if we're not careful. You know, has demonic activity diminished in some sense? Or how has it been changed uh, between first century and where we live now? Uh, how do we make sense of that biblically? You know, we don't see you know, exorcisms going on on a day-to-day -day basis. We'll talk about that in this class. Um, a basic definition of a worldview would be like a network of assumptions about everything, even unconscious ones. And oftentimes that's what it is. People aren't thinking in worldview categories, but they have a worldview. They're interpreting their experience. They're interpreting what they see by these assumptions. And they may be biblical, they may not be. And you would ask, you know, questions related to worldview like, what is real? How do we know that reality? Um, how does the physical relate to the spiritual? Assumptions being made about that. How should we relate 
to spiritual realities. There's an ethical uh, element to it as well. And then how about this? What is the real problem in this war as we conceive it? Who's the enemy? <laughs> Knowing that's going to help us be directed to the solution. What's the solution to it? So if, we, if we're going to get our bearings right about all of this, um, point three on your outline, we need biblical wisdom and discernment. We need to see to the root of things through the lens of Scripture. In other words, we need to think God's thoughts after himself about spiritual warfare. Scripture as our authority and guide will help us to do a number of things. Focus on the right things. I mentioned biblical proportion earlier. We need to emphasize what Scripture emphasizes in relation to the spiritual battle. And avoid those errors we talked about earlier, the two opposite errors. And here's, here's an important one that we're going to talk about in this class. Scripture will provide the larger context and redemptive story of this war. And that's essential. Because, if I don't know, if you're like me, your tendency, when we think about spiritual warfare, we think, me against the enemy. You know, it's my, the temptations that I'm facing, it's me against the devil. It's me against the demons or whatever they employ in their, uh, in their attacks. Scripture, in the larger redemptive historical story, depicts it as kingdom versus kingdom. This is a larger battle that we're a part of. And that's essential to see because that's where our hope is, in the larger battle involving Christ, primarily. As opposed to just me and the enemy. And then, thirdly, the Bible's going to help us and direct us to ask the right questions, the important questions, rather than the speculative ones. And that happens a lot with this topic. Lots of speculation, lots of looking beyond the text to make sense of things. Sometimes, and we gotta be humble enough to admit this, Sometimes the questions we want answered are, in God's wisdom, not the most important questions. And we need to be redirected sometimes um, to what's truly important about this battle and what's our responsibility in it. And we'll talk about that find it interesting that Thomas Brooks in his book uh, Precious Remedies Against Satan's Devices is written in the 17th century uh, by one of the Puritans and he warns of one of the devices of Satan is to get us to mind more the hidden counsel of God than what he's revealed. To be so preoccupied with the unknowns and the speculative stuff that we ignore the stuff he's told us to do. And that's, that's a distraction uh, tactic to get us off track. And that can easily happen with this topic. Um, some important questions uh, regarding spiritual warfare that we want to talk about with Scripture as our guide. First of all, what war? <laughs> what war? You know, sometimes... I'm afraid, I think we can all be guilty of this, is, you know, in our day-to-day -day lives, um, maybe there's days and weeks that go by that we really don't sense that we're in any war at all. We're just kind of coasting through life, reacting to things, not really thinking beyond what we see, and that can be a dangerous thing for us. But Paul, in the scriptures, often uses 
the metaphor of war to depict the entire Christian life. 2 Corinthians 10, which we've covered in our sermon series, Ephesians 6, 1 Timothy, and others. And the church has historically appreciated this fact. Um, it was obvious in the first few centuries of the church, first three centuries or so, although persecution's been going on since the fall, right? Since the fall, uh, believers in God and Christ have been persecuted. But in the early church, you know, they were being overtly persecuted, harshly, under the Roman government. And those who were writing about this at the time uh, were very much aware that this was a spiritual battle. It wasn't a political battle to be fought with the Roman government over views and issues and policies. This was a spiritual battle at its very core. And throughout this century's Christian hymns, some of my favorite hymns are really warfare hymns, like Be Thou My Vision, where it has the line, Be Thou My Vision, uh, Be Thou My Battle Shield, Sword for My Fight. Mighty fortress is our God. And through this world with devils filled should threaten to undo us. You know, the prince of darkness, we tremble not for him. His rage we can endure. Um, all of these have scriptural roots to this imagery that they're pointing out. Even our own Westminster standards, uh, the chapter in the Confession on Sanctification, describes the Christian life as a continual, irreconcilable war between the spirit and the flesh. And the question I ask us today is, you know, are we practically in touch with this war? We may talk about it, we may affirm it, oh yeah, that's, that's in there, that's in the scriptures. We sing about it. But are we practically in touch? Does it have any bearing on how we live our daily lives? Or do we just sort of coast through like everybody else, um, not really aware of these things? Um, another important question to ask, I've already mentioned it earlier, but who is the enemy? How does he operate? You know, if you were to um, consider, you know, a military general or commander of, of the forces, you know, they need to be informed about who they're up against, who their enemy is, how they operate, so that they can su successfully counter those operations and defeat the enemy, right? I mean, that's obvious. Same could be said for an athletic team or a coach, you know, coach wouldn't be a coach for very long if he didn't watch game film and <laughs> uh, all of this kind of thing to prepare his team for, for competition. But how often, again, how often do we, when it comes to this, we just wing it. We just sort of stumble onto the battlefield of life without any forethought or preparation or uh, study prayer, all the things that we'll talk about as we go through this material. You know, is the real threat to us in our context, is it, is it social? Is it political? Um, you know, how you frame the problem will influence how you look for the solution in this battle. Here's another interesting question. Okay, when do we fight this battle? <coughs> Have you ever wondered or asked yourself, you know, maybe you've had some strange experience or you felt attacked somehow um, or you were in a difficult situation and you've wondered, you know, is this, is this spiritual warfare? Is this a spiritual battle? Almost as implying, you know, because all the way up till now it wasn't, but 
right now it seems like I'm being attacked you know I mentioned those more on the fringe experiences at the beginning uh, that stuck in my mind um, but as we'll see spiritual warfare is not just these bizarre moments strange unexplainable experiences but we are at all times in a spiritual battle whether we realize it or not the battle is going on even if our perception of it our tangible experience of it waxes and wanes the battle is there and the scriptures are very clear about that okay so I asked when do we fight where do we fight Maybe that sounds like a strange question, but, you know, I think sometimes we get into thinking that, you know, the, the real spiritual battle is down in Haiti, you know. It's down on the, the ends of the earth somewhere where there's, you know, witchcraft and uh, nature worship and all of this kind of thing. It's on the foreign mission field. Or is it when you sit in the pew on Sundays and you can't focus on what's going on in the service you're distracted I mean we can all identify with that one right um, you know we're trying even when we're trying to worship trying to sing songs sometimes that's the hardest when we know we should be listening and focusing on the Lord sometimes that's when we have the hardest time so, you know, where are the battle lines drawn? How do we fight? There's passages that you can probably think of right now that uh, come in your mind that uh, we'll be looking at. But how, you know, how do the scriptures say we actually fight this thing? Um, you know, it's interesting throughout the history of the church there you know it hasn't always been obvious you know uh, sometimes battles are between flesh and blood over these things it is that what the scriptures emphasize what should be our focus how are we helped in the battle these are all questions uh, that we'll be addressing as we go along I want to quote from the Puritan William Gurnall who wrote this massive work called The Christian in Complete Armor. And it's his, uh, his basically a, his sermons, his exposition of the armor of God passage in Ephesians 6. And at the beginning of that work he says, the stage whereon this war is fought is every man's soul. Here is no neuter, he says. He means no neutrality. There's no neutrality in this war. The whole world is engaged in the quarrel, either for God against Satan or for Satan against God. You know, Jesus says statements like this to that effect. If you're not for me, you're against me. There's no sitting on the fence. You know, we might say someone who says, I don't know what you're talking about. I don't know what war you're talking about. Yeah, whose side are they on? So the battle lines extend to the human soul across the whole earth, in essence. This is where the battle rages let's talk for a moment just just to kind of give you an overview of where we're headed um, sort of an outline of topics that we're going to discuss in the weeks to come and the emphasis is going to be on practical living okay this isn't just a theory this is God's told us about the battle so that we'll fight the battle that we'll live it out uh, following the Lord Jesus Christ so next week we're going to begin by talking about the origin and the nature of this conflict. 
the grand conflict. You know, I mentioned kingdom versus kingdom earlier. We're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about who our enemy is. What does Scripture tell us about our enemy? What are things that are employed by the enemy in this battle? We're also going to talk about the enemy within. There's actually a book by that same title about uh, the flesh, uh, sin that dwells in us that still needs to be put to death, that we struggle, you know, the flesh against the spirit struggle that the confession highlighted. We're going to talk a little bit about that. We're going to talk about uh, Satan's devices, his tactics. What are some common ways that he tries to trip us up, deceive us? And then we're going to look at the divine warrior. That's one of the ways in which God is depicted and Christ himself is depicted in Scripture as a divine warrior in this war, in this war that we're in. We're going to look at the incarnation and how that changes the conflict. You know, there's a history to this war and there's a development and there's a conclusion. So we'll look at what the scriptures say about that. We're going to talk about the armor of God passage. What does that mean practically for us? And then lastly, we'll, we'll stop with uh, warfare in the last days. How scripture talks about warfare in the last days, the spiritual battle. And as I've said in other contexts, the primary way in which scripture speaks of the last days is between the comings of Christ. In other words... That's us. How does the battle look for us in the last days? So that's where we're headed um, as we move forward. I want to leave you with just a word of encouragement from the scriptures. So if you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn to Hebrews chapter 2. I'm just going to read a brief passage there, make just a few comments. This is a wonderful passage about many things about who Christ is, but even how it affects this war that we're in. Hebrews chapter 2, starting in verse 14. It, it says, Since therefore the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise partook of the same things that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is the devil, and deliver all those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. For surely it is not angels that he helps, but he helps the offspring of Abraham. Therefore he had to be made like his brothers in every respect, so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. For because he himself has suffered when tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. So this says a lot about who Christ is and what he's done. Um, first of all, he had to become incarnate to accomplish God's perfect plan of, sa of saving those who are flesh and blood. Notice it says, which is an amazing statement if you think about it, surely it is not angels that he helps. You know, earlier in the letter, he talked about Christ is superior to angels, and made, angels are uh, ministering spirits for the sake of God's people. They serve us at the command of God. And Christ didn't become an angel to be a substitute for angels. He came flesh and blood to save us, the offspring of Abraham, which Galatians 3 tells us those are all who believe in Christ, all who are connected by faith to him. And not only that, but he's a faithful high priest. He defeats the devil. He makes propitiation for the sins of the people. And he's able to help us when we're tempted in this war.
So there's much encouragement to be taken from that. Another passage, just to go along with that, in 1 John 3, verse 8, this is where he says, uh, the reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. There's a powerful passage. So there's, you know, in this larger history of the war that we're involved in, Christ's first coming had a significant uh, turning point in this war. And of course, we look forward to his return for the consummation of this victory that he has won. But those, just those few passages, and there's many more like it, Christ is the key. He is the central focus in the spiritual war that we're in. It's not the speculative stuff, it's Christ. In him, we have no need to fear, but rather by faith we conquer because he has conquered. Um, you know, the different places in the scriptures, believers are said to be more than conquerors. In the book of Revelation, uh, believers, those who follow the Lamb, they conquer. They, they participate in Christ's victory in this war. And we have no need to fear whatever the enemy would uh, seek to attack us with or to enlist in his service to attack the church. The gates of hell will not prevail against Christ's church. And I was, I'm always encouraged, uh, if you remember the verse, some of you are going through the Hebrews class, I don't know how far along you are in that class, but in chapter 11, where it's describing the faith of uh, Moses, it makes a passing reference by faith, he did not fear the wrath of the king. You know, that's, that's one of the manifestations, the expressions of faith is we don't fear. We don't fear what man can do to us. We fear God you know, in, a hel in a healthy reverence for our Heavenly Father. We know he's in control. We know Christ is victorious. We need to be rem these are simple truths, but we, need to, we all need to be reminded of them because we can get distracted and get discouraged. The outcome of this war that we are about to study is settled. It's not in question. It's not up for grabs. It's not unknown. The scriptures tell us this is a settled war. It's a one war, in essence, in Christ. But the question for us practically is, will we wage the good warfare, as Paul tells Timothy? Do we believe that enough to wage the good warfare in our context, in our lives? Or not? Not to fight is to be on the wrong side of the war. Let me pray for us. Well, Lord, uh, thank you for these truths, even the few that we looked at tonight. We pray for your wisdom and insight. Give us understanding to know what your word tells us about this war, but also stir our hearts to be engaged as you've called us to. To be walking by faith not merely by sight. Help us not to fear, but to look to Christ, our victorious Savior. And we pray this in His name. Amen.